Hi, uh, in this video, we're going to talk about uh, Samaragi's theorem and its links to something called Furstenberg recurrence, uh, which is, uh, or Furstenberg multiple recurrence, a theorem in dynamical systems and ergodic theory. Um, so it's kind of a, uh, it's an example of this general principle uh, that links theorems in ergodic theory and dynamical systems with more combinatorial statements like Samaragi's theorem. Uh, and it's, um, yeah, so it's, it's a bit of a harder video than the previous two that I've put up. Um, in particular, it needs um, quite, a, like, quite a bit of analysis um, at, at an undergrad level, but um, still it's not easy. So I'll try to go pretty slowly. It might be maybe too slow for some people, but I'll go pretty slowly and uh, I'll state, restate all the things from analysis that we'll need. Okay, so. So first of all, um, let's just talk about what Samaritan's theorem is even about, and it's a theorem about arithmetic progression. So we all know from grade school that we sometimes have these, or we've all been shown kind of patterns like this, where it's like, say we have one, and then four, and seven, ten, and then they ask you in kindergarten, uh, what's next? And you stare at it for a little while, and you're like, oh, you know, we, we added three here, and we added three here, and three here, and so the next one should be, plus three, so it's 13, right? Um, so that's an arithmetic regression. And more generally, we can, well, we can define them for more general uh, groups. So we'll define this. So let Z be an abelian group. Okay, now if we take an integer, so this Z is the integers, um, and a small Z, in the group set, we let nz be the iterated sum. Um, so what does that mean? For example, um, it's like 2z would be z plus z. Um, you can take negative numbers, so minus 3z is minus z minus z minus z. Um, you know, 0 times z is just um, the identity. Um, so that's what it is. Uh, and then, so now we define an arithmetic regression. So an arithmetic regression uh, is a set of the form of the term of brightness. I'm blinding myself. The set of the form um, A a plus r, <clears throat> a plus two r, and you can kind of see where this is going, to all the way up to a plus k minus one r. Okay, and so there's some terminology. A is the base point. Um, r is the uh, step, step, or some common difference. Some people say the common difference. Um, k is the length. Okay, so I mean above here, uh, up here the, the length would be five, the common difference would be three, and the base point is one. Okay, and normally we take r to not be zero because if r is zero, we just get the same number repeated multiple times. And as a set, that's just the singleton set. Um, as a sequence, you know, you could have like one, 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 one. That would technically be an arithmetic regression, but we're just going to take r to not be zero. And if you're confused by the fact that there's sort of integers here and this other Z is an arbitrary abelian group, um, no worry, because we're going to take Z to be the integers in this case. And that's what Samaria's theorem is about. It's a theorem about um, integers. Okay, so this, I mean, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to go pretty slow. And we'll start just with some history because it's pretty interesting. Um, the whole sort of search for arithmetic progressions um, starts with a theorem of van der Waarden. Um, from 1927, so quite a while ago. Um, it, said, it states that for any RK integer, um, there exists, uh, some n such that the interval zero through n, and that's the integer interval, um, 
such that if, so I guess we'll go here, if uh, this interval is partitioned into disjoint sets, and we'll, we'll call them C1, C2, up to CR. So we partition this interval into disjoint sets, then some CI, so one of these CI uh, has an arithmetic progression of length k. Okay, and this is for any k. Um, so um, this is kind of a sort of a, an intricate statement. It's, it's a finitary statement, right? It's telling you there is an n for, there's a finite n for any r and k that you choose, but there's a more um, sort of natural way of stating it, an infinitary way of stating it. Um, and that's if you have all the integers, or at least all the non-negative integers, and you, well, there's infinitely many of them, and you, if you partition them into finitely many um, parts, then, um, then so, so say you color them into finitely many colors. Say we take all the integers and color them um, one of the seven, seven colors of the rainbow. Um, there has to be some color in which you can find arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Okay. Um, so that's a statement about um, sort of coloring integers and finding arithmetic progressions. But um, Erdish and Turan, Erdish, um, so Paul Erdish, Paul Turan, and Turan, they're two Hungarian mathematicians, and they they suspect that this has nothing to do with this partitioning. There's nothing special about this process, but it has more to do with density. So we conjectured that it has to do with density. Okay, so what exactly do we mean by density? A set A subset of uh, non negative integers has positive for density, okay, if, uh, I guess it's, it's upper density is positive, so it's no weird as I just stated it, but this is the upper density, it was big enough. So we take A, we intersect it with the first um, n plus one non-negative integers, and we take the side, so this is the cardinality, over how many there could possibly be. Right, so there could just, there's n plus one integers inside this interval. We intersect A with it, and how big is it compared to how many there could possibly be if this is positive. Okay, so this is the upper zip. This is the upper density, and we say that A has positive upper density if it's really easy. Okay, what does it have to do with Van Varden? Well, if we take the, all the integers and color them to finally many colors, then if you think about the densities, um, because the average density would be one over R, um, there has to be at least, you know, the maximum is greater than, or it's at least the average. So there has to be some color that has positive upper density. And that would immediately imply that the is theorem. So Erich and Turan suspect that there is a, there's, that this is sort of what's behind it. Okay, and so this is, um, this was conjectured uh, 1936. Okay. Um, now, okay, so, oh my God, Zoom, Zoom is being wrong. Okay, so now, um, so in the timeline, this is 1936, um, in, we're moving to the 50s, so Roth, uh, in 1953, he proves K equals three, and he uses, um, Fourier analysis to prove this. And he gets, you know, pretty good bounds on um, the end that you need for R and K. Uh, oops, I guess I haven't really stated what it, uh, what Roth proved, but he, they, Erich and Turan conjectured that Van der Varden's theorem holds for uh, any set that has positive upper density, not just like a CI that's a partition, but any set that, any subset of the integers that has positive upper density, you can find um, an arithmetic progression of like k from k. Um, okay, so he proved this for k equals three, so that's um, progressions of just size three. So that's one, that's another one, this one is one. Okay, so already that was pretty difficult. Uh, now Semerady enters the scene 
and in 1969, he proves K equals four. And then uh, in 1975, it's a general case. Okay, so what does the statement actually look like? So theorem, you know, I'll just state it properly. Okay, so um, we can state it this way. Any subset A of the non-negative integers with positive over density has arithmetic progressions of arbitrary length. Okay, but equivalently, Okay. We can say, state it kind of in this finitary way that we stated that in Barnes theorem um, for any oops, any k integer and delta uh, real number greater than zero. There exists n such that uh, for all subsets of zero through n um, with sort of more than a positive fraction of the numbers that could be there. Uh, A contains a k term regression. Okay, so that's similar this theorem. Uh, that's two ways of stating it. And so the original proof was really long uh, and complicated, but we'll prove um, we'll prove the equivalence at least of these two, the infinitary and the finitary statements, and it should give you an idea of what. I mean, it's the same for Van der Waals theorem. Um, okay, so <clears throat> uh, proof of equivalence of finitary and infinitary. Okay, so the easy way is um, finitary implies infinitary. And well, why is that? So we assume that, let's assume that the finitary statement holds and let, let A subset of um, the positive integers have positive density. Okay, so then, you know, because the lim soup is, so lim soup. A intersection of zero through n over n plus one, because this limb soup is positive. Okay, so for any like in, I guess we'll have to let k. Let k be in n. So because this limb soup is positive, there has to be some um, there has to be some n such that it actually is is greater than zero. So say you know this is a uh, this is delta, then there must be an n. Such that um, a intersection n is greater than delta n plus one, right? And now we just apply the finitary statement and we can get an equation of length k within a here. Okay. Um, well, it's actually within this, so, but it's an a. Okay, so conversely, suppose the finitary statement fails. Okay, so say the finitary statement fails, then we're just gonna systematically negate everything. So the there exists. Uh, k, uh, integer k, uh, delta greater than zero, uh, such that for all n that exists, um, an a n subset of zero through n uh, with not too few elements. So a n is greater than or equal to delta n plus one. And uh, a n has no arithmetic question. Okay, so what does this look like? So let's say we have, this is kind of, this is zero. These are all the integers. 
um, we're saying that there exists an a n for every n. So there's an a one here. Let's say it's here. A one's here. Uh, there's a two and a three somewhere. It has no arithmetic progression of length. Um, okay. And now we notice that if we put these, um, so each of these little intervals has no arithmetic of, of length k. If we shift it, say we take this one, um, it's really messy. So let me, let me read, read all these. I'm drawing like this. So this, uh, oops. this is a1. This is, um, this is a2. This is a3, maybe. I actually don't know what the sizes are. I'm just drawing them randomly. Um, I don't know if they should get bigger or smaller, but anyway. Um, the point is, if we shift these around, it still it still has no arithmetic progression, right? The set the property that these AI have, or these AN have, is that they have no arithmetic progression of length k. Now, if we put two that are too close together, maybe there's an arithmetic progression of length k, k minus one here, um, k minus one here, and k minus one here, and then they like become an arithmetic progression of length greater than k here. So, I mean, to avoid that, we'll just put them far enough apart. Okay. So this, the, if their density delta, if A has a density delta inside these, um, inside these sets, then if we just put them far enough apart, say we space them, you know, um, if we space them far enough apart uh, to avoid an arithmetic question, we'll have um, density, um, well, it's at least delta, delta over two, delta over three, it doesn't matter. The point is it's still um, positive. So specifically, if we let A be the union of uh, N uh, in N of A N after, after translation, then A has density, we'll say it's greater than equal to delta over three and no uh, arithmetic equation of length. Okay, so that would say that would um, that's the, the, that would contradict the infinitary statement of some of these Okay, so we've shown, I mean, Summary's theorem is a hard theorem to prove, um, but we've shown the equivalence of just the two formulations that should give you some uh, idea about Van der Barnes theorem. Okay, and so let's, um, we can talk about some bounds. I mean, so I mentioned before that the um, Fourier analytic proof of k equals three has much better bounds than the um, bounds obtained by Simmerati in his combinatorial argument. And so this was actually improved by, so Fourier proofs. Um, uh, k equals four, I think was done by Gowers in 1998. And actually the general case is also done by Gowers. I think in 2001, if I'm not wrong. And so now, you know, these are the best, best bounds. I think they're the best bounds to date. Um, though the one in the combinatorial argument has an N that's like a tower of twos related to um, D um, to delta and K. So that's really bad. Um, but if we don't care about bounds at all, and we just want to prove the statements, then um, Furstenberg showed that uh, one can actually use ergodic theory to, to achieve that. Um, and so that's what this video is mainly going to be about. And to do that, we're going to need some terminology and some um, theory from uh, dynamical systems. So we're going to let x, f, mean the probability space. Okay, this means that mu of the measure of the whole space is wrong. Okay, and t, a function from x to x, the measure preserving. Okay, um, this means that for any, so T, uh, sorry, the measure of the pre-image of any measurable set is the same as the measure of the set, at least for all um, measurable sets. <clears throat> okay, uh, and I mean, note that t is not invertible in the sense. So this is not actually t 
it's not like the inverse of t times e. It's it's the preimage. Okay, so t doesn't have to be invariable. Um, now, if if f is a measurable function, measurable, that's measurable function um, from x to r. Okay, t acts as a shift operator. So what does that mean? Um, so we can we can make a new function t n of f that is just f of t n times um, applied to x. So we kind of like apply, we move x first by t and then apply f. And so that creates sort of a new function. And so it's an oper um, shift operator. And so now we have this really gross lemma. I mean, I'm not really a big fan of it. I a lot of stuff we put in here, into here so we don't have to. So let x f of u be a polynomial space. Space. Let f be a bounded measurable function. Um, with um, f has to have positive expectation. So the of f over the whole space is greater than zero. Um, okay, so now we think we let delta be greater than, uh, delta greater than zero be such that the set G, um, which depends on, it depends on, uh, it depends on delta, but I'm just gonna call it G. Okay, but this set has measure T as your preserving. Um, exist T um, measurable set of T with a measure of T uh, greater than or equal to such that. Has positive over density. Okay, so this is a very convoluted statement. What is it kind of saying? Uh, this is the link between the density that we use in some radius theorem and measure, which um, we're going to need in first and grades um, recurrence. Um, it's saying that if like the best way to think about it, I think, and the way that we're going to use it is for f to be the characteristic function of a measurable set. And if that's the case, then this Rx is the set of all times that we are, it's the set of all times that we go into. Okay, it's the set of all, um, how, how's this supposed to be saying this? If you notice, it's a set of all times where x is going to be, where tn of x is going to be in g. So this is f of tn of x, right, by this. This is f of tn of x. And if it's greater than delta, then x is in, um, then, then tn of x is going to be in g. And so r of x is the set of all times where tn of x is going to be in g. So time, meaning if we think of n going like one, two, three, and x is kind of like flying around the space, um, that's all the times that it goes into g. Okay, and it has positive open density for all x in ut. Okay, so we're gonna prove this. So proof. Okay, so um, well, first note note that for all x in x and n in n. Okay, if we say t n of f of x is greater than or equal to delta. That's the same as f of t n of x is greater than or equal to delta, like I said, which is the same thing as t n of x is in g. And that's the same as saying x is in 
pre-image of Tn. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to use shift invariance. So we use shift invariance and we compute the mu mu g, measure g. It's well, it's the integral of the characteristic function g. So I use chi for the characteristic function. Um, d mu. Um, and it doesn't change if we take a, an average, right? So this is kind of dumb, but we're just going to average um, n equals 1 to n chi of g. And now we rewrite this um, in terms of that pre image. And uh, this is small n, that's a big n. Uh, uh, characteristic function of t minus n g. Okay. Now let a n be the set of all x and x such that one over n this average n equals one chi t minus n g. Oops, g is in the subscript. Um, d mu. Um, oops, sorry. There's no integral. It's just x. Okay is greater than or equal to mu g over two. Okay, um, so we claim that mu of a n, okay, has to be greater than mu g over two. And why is that? Well, that if not, we could take this integral and split it over to um, split it into an integral over a n and a n complement. Yeah, let's just write it out. So this integral, one over n, uh, it splits into an integral over a n and a n complement. And um, so it splits into a n. For a n, we'll just, it's less than or equal to just one, right? Because the, yeah, this is one. So, or it's at most one. And then over a n complement, we actually still keep the thing. So. The sum chi t minus n of g. And well, on the left side, we have a new plus, it's less than or equal to mu g over 2, which is, I'm saying, we're, we're supposing this is fails. Um, and on the other side, we have uh, it's definitely less than mu g over 2 because of what the set even is. Right? If we're, it's not in a n, this is a less than. Um, and that's less than equal to, or that's equal to g, right? But that would contradict this entire thing that we have up here. Because we literally just showed that mu g is equal to that. So we can't have that it's less than, okay? Um, so this is otherwise, I'll put that in brackets. Okay, so we, we know that this is true. Okay, so now note, um, this lim soup, so there's a lim soup of sets, um, and I always mess up the lim soup. Okay, a n sets lim soup um, is the set of all x and x that are in a n uh, infinitely often. Okay, so that's the same as saying that it's all the x and x such that the lim soup of n is in this infinity, the recurrence set. Um, I guess this is the one. Um, it's greater than equal to n g over two. Okay. Um, well, um, if we take the measure of this room suit, um, a n, it is the same as the measure of the limb soup of set, right? So I'm, I'm just writing it out, so n equals one to infinity, n equals n to infinity, a n. And because all the a n are, have measure uh, greater than mu g over two, we can interchange the, the limit on the inside, the limit on the outside, and we'll get this is greater than equal to mu g over two. Okay, so so set t to be mu 
soup. Okay. Okay. So this theorem just said we want to find an ET for any T with uh, this specific um, measure such that the recurrent set um, has positive upper density for all X and ET. And we've shown that ET is the limb soup, is the limb soup of this AN that we constructed with you. Okay, so it's kind of gory, um, but that's what we have. Okay, now we can formulate Furstenberg's recurrence theorem. Okay, so um, theorem. So this is Furstenberg, 1977. So Furstenberg must have, I mean, if you look, um, Sam Rady proved his theorem in 1975. Furstenberg must have read that and been like, I, I can do this. Um, and just two years later, we came up with this. <laughs> okay, so let x f mu. Um, let's put t in there to measure preserving diamond the system. V preserving system. Okay, let f be a bounded measurable function. Um, with um, positive expectation. Okay, now for any k in n, okay, for the lim n, lim n, n goes to infinity of one over n sum s equals one to n integral of f, f. and then now we take sort of product of all these functions k minus one s t mu that's greater than zero okay so it's a kind of a gross statement it's saying that there's sort of arithmetic progressions in the time stamps so if, if you take sort of once again, I'm thinking of f as the characteristic function of the set, which is what we're going to use it, uh, which is how we're going to use it. But if, say, we have a set, this is x, and this is some set, and then we have, you know, the set of all points, or there's an earth, uh, like, this is where it is at. It's going to walk around. It's going to walk around. It's going to walk around over time, right? And the set of times that it falls inside here form an, forms an arithmetic question of that, okay? Okay, so it's kind of the same, uh, sort of. I think that's a slip. yeah. Um, okay, so we're not going to prove the statement once again. So this is uh, the statement is. Uh, I don't know how complicated it is. I, I assume it was less complicated than Summary's original statement, uh, original proof. Sorry of his theorem, um, but we're not going to prove it. We're going to show that Furstenberg's multiple recurrence theorem is equivalent to Summary's theorem, which is somewhat surprising because I mean one is a purely it's a, a pure ergodic statement about dynamic systems and the other one's a combinatorial statement about arithmetic regressions and it turns out that they're the same um one other note if you let k equals two here oops let k equal two here this is um point r is recurrence theorem which is um, more famous I guess okay so proof of equivalence of summary and first thing. Okay. So first we'll suppose that summary is still in So suppose summary is theorem. Okay, now we let x f mu t be a dynamic system. Um, f bounded, measurable, um, expectation, f. The expectation of f greater than zero. Okay, now let k be an n. We, um, we want to prove Furstenberg's recurrence. So we're gonna, just like in the lemma, 
I mean, we want to use 11 now. So we let delta be greater than zero um, and such that the set such that the set G, just remember is the set of all X in X, such that F of X is greater than delta has mu of G greater than zero. Okay. By, by now we've had lemma. Okay. There is set ET, remember with um, measure of ET greater than equal to mu equal to two, such that R of X, which is Um, T and F X is greater than delta. Okay, has positive equivalency. Um, for all all X in E T. So we've just applied uh, lemma D. That's all done. We've written it the entire statement. Okay, now we use some radius theorem because this has upper density by some radius theorem. Okay, there exists and not such that for all x in E T there is an arithmetic progression of nine K in R X intersection zero through n. Okay. Uh, that's what um, some of the students says. Now, now there's kind of a problem because all these arithmetic versions are different, right? For each x. Okay, but we can kind of make a accountability argument because if so, say k is the total number total number of eight of arithmetic versions in uh, zero through n. How many arithmetic versions can actually fit in there? Um, it's actually just a finite number, right? Because we have k less than equal to, um, we'll just bound it above, it's kind of a stupid bound, but we'll just bound it above by the set of all k subsets of that interval. So it's finite, but but um, with the set, like, um, like because et has positive measure, um, there's a fixed progression. So there's, So we can, now we can fix a progression, okay? Um, and we'll illustrate that PT is A, A plus R, A plus A minus one R, um, such that um, ET prime, which is sort of a subset of ET, such that PT is a subset of RX, Um, so check this set has has um, has positive measure, and in fact, we can even say what that positive measure is because, well, the original set has mg over two. Now there are k progressions, and so the average um, measure would have to be sort of um, over k, and there's one that's greater than equal to that, so we just divide by k. Um, okay, so this has measure that. Okay, now let's just work from what we have. So we have um, the integral of this product, T R F T oops, A minus one R F. No, um, smaller R is in the exponent. Okay, mm -hmm. um, that's greater than equal to so this is over all the entirety of x. So that's greater than equal to um, t minus a e t prime f t r f t minus one r f e mu 
and we use shift invariance. So um, I put that thing sneakily in there, put a in there so that we can do this. Et prime ta um, f ta plus r f ta plus k minus one r f. So now you know we kind of have this arithmetic question going on in the exponent there. E mu and well each of these is greater than uh, greater than delta, right? Uh, I think greater than two. Um, and while well, that whole set has measure mu g over 2k, so this whole thing is greater than equal to, greater than equal to delta of the k mu g over 2k. Okay, now, I mean, we're still not done because um, we've done this for a fixed t, right? The, the progression that we got here, pt, definitely depends on t. We picked it. Um, we, we took this et prime from the et, and then we, yeah, that's the progression. That's in all of um, the rx's. Um, but the bound, th this bound doesn't. So no matter what t you put there, as long as it's much preserving, you get this bound. So we can replace um, t by t to the n. So replace t by t to the n. And so what that does is, I don't want to rewrite the whole thing again, but that puts just an m here. There's n there and n there. So r gets replaced with mr everywhere. OK. And note that, I mean, and, um, and, and so and now we note that r is less than m naught, right? Because if we have um, 0 through n0. If r was greater than n0, we'd fall right off the edge of the internal right away. OK. So let's take this. Let's take an average now. So 1 over n0 sum s prime equals 1 n0 integral over all x f t n s prime of f. So we're summing now over all r. I mean, I've, s prime is now the r. Possible r that a key could be anywhere between one and n not. Um, so t minus one, m is prime, e mu, k, mu g over two k. Okay, so we're like almost done. There's just this pesky m s prime. If we look where what we want, if we look at what we want, we, um, there's no m, there's no m s prime. There's just s. We can get this wrong. Okay, whatever. Um, yeah, so there, there's just an S. There's no MS. All right, but that's also okay because if we let's for convenience let N um, be greater than or equal to N naught squared. Okay, if one less than equal to S less than equal to N, uh, and S is MS. So let's say MS is some number S. Um, how many ways can this actually happen? How many ways can s be equal to ms, right? Um, well, you know, because one is less than equal to s prime, less than equal to n naught, and one is less than equal to m, less than equal to m over n naught, right? We chose n so that number of ways is less than equal to min, um, minimum of n naught, and over n naught. That's just n naught. But I how we chose that. Okay, so now we have this n naught over n of m equals sum over all n. Okay, now we average over all s, s prime equals one to n naught integral f t n s prime. F T uh, oops, T K minus one M S prime mu that's great than equal to delta K mu G over two K. Now we said uh, let's rewrite this with S equals M naught. Kind of ask this here, but we um, we cross this out so it's the same. So it's one over N. Now we just take 
a sum of s equals one. Um, this whole thing, f t n, oh, it's just s now, t s of f, t k minus one s f, oops, f here, d mu, and that's greater than equal to delta k mu g over two k, um, but we need to divide by n naught, right? because we said there's n naught ways of that, this, there's less than n naught ways that this could possibly happen. And now we're done because it is greater than zero. So we have this exact sum that we wanted. It's not greater than zero all the time. It's greater than zero for all r n of n, right? Because we picked n not uh, n greater than n not uh, n not squared, and that's what we had here because we just have this limit. Okay. So we prove first and Bray's multiple recurrence, assuming that we have some radius here, and with the lemma that we proved earlier. Okay. So. That's one. Um, that's one implication. Now we're going to prove the other implication. So now assume first number. Okay. So let we want to prove some radius theorem. So let A such so that the integers have positive upper. Let's see. I remember what this means. Um, this means that lin soup um, n goes to infinity, a intersection zero to n over n plus one is greater than zero. And that's a lin soup. Um, on a subsequence, we can get the lin nth to be equal to that also, right? So we choose n1, n2, and so on, infinitely many, such that lin nth as j goes to infinity, we're, we're going over the nj's. So j over nj plus one, that's greater than zero. Okay, so now we have the lin soup and greater than zero, but the lin soup is greater than zero in general, and the lin inf is only greater than zero on this um, subsequence. Okay, so we're going to consider to consider l infinity. So what is this? This is this this is the space of all real valued sequences, um, bounded real valued sequences, um, indexed by the indexed by n. I guess it's n naught. Okay. Um, there's a subspace. So there's of convergent sequences. Okay, that's a subspace. Um, and lambda x being the limit as j goes to infinity of xj is a bounded linear functional on this subspace of convergent sequences, right? Because they're convergent, they have limits, and adding limits and scaling limits, you don't get um, it's it's a linear functional. So it is a linear functional. Lambda is linear functional, so by the Han Banach theorem. Um, we want this linear, we sort of want this to work on the whole um, space L infinity and uh, Han Bach theorem lets us do that. Theorem, um, which I'm pretty sure is non constructive. Uh, Han Bach theorem, there is, it's very much non constructive. There is um, lambda from L infinity of N to R such that. Oops, my writing is getting worse and worse. Such that, okay, what we want this to have, it's sandwiched between the limit in xj. Um, okay, so I mean, the lim, inf and lim soup may not um, be the same for a general sequence that's not convergent, but we have this. Um, function uh, on sequences that uh, is sandwiched between the limit and the soup. Okay. Okay, so now let x be this space, 0, 1 uh, to the end. So it's the space of all sequences indexed by the non-negative uh, integers that are 0 or 1, so it's strings of 0. Okay, and it has the product of all the um, 
overall sigma algebra. And so we let T be the left shift. It's a left shift operator that says T of X is this sequence, X n plus one. And not. So it takes a whole sequence, an infinite sequence going off to the right and um, it shifts it left by one. So it lops off the zero term and shifts everything left. So, I mean, note that it's not invertible, right? That's why before we didn't have an invertible sequence, still don't have one. Uh, I mean, sorry, before we noted that we don't have an invertible, um, the T doesn't have to be an invertible. Um, what would you say? Like it's, it's not, I'm just gonna find it. So I can finish this thought. We just want we want t to be measure preserving, and then I said here that it doesn't it's not necessarily invertible, and that's why that was important because we have a very non-invertible shift operation going on. Okay, so now we let a this is a function um, or a sequence be given by given by a n is one if n is an a and zero otherwise. Okay, so remember we want to show that this um, there's arithmetic expressions in a, and we're going to do that by letting this um, sequence. So a, I mean a is a sequence um, that depends on this a. Here. It's one whenever we're in a and zero whenever we're outside of a. Okay, so now for any. Any sequence of indices S1 through Sm, we define, and so these are non negative groups, define, um, we define a measure on 0, 1, through n. Okay? And that's this measure. So mu S1, Sm, B1 cross B. M um, is equal to, we use lambda, big lambda, one over nj plus one, sum i equals zero to j. So now we take the characteristic function of each of them and we see if ts1, that's like, yeah, I'll just write it out in the next one, em. T S M A I. This is a sequence. J equals one to infinity, and we apply lambda to this whole thing. Okay, so the E I are subsets of zero one, and we're seeing if T applied S times to A I um, is in E one. So uh, so T T applied S one times to A I is in E one. T applied as two times to AI is in E2. Okay, so, and we're gonna multiply that all together and we want all of them to be true because we're multiplying. And that's kind of a sequence as I goes to, as, as I goes to infinity. And this is kind of <clears throat> Okay, um, by, well, we, we need to, okay, I, I guess there's some technicalities here. If, first of all, if we permute these indices round, okay, um, that doesn't change this because we just permute this around and multiplication is commutative. So permuting indices doesn't change anything. If we add an, um, if we add another index, I guess I should write this one up. So for all, uh, let S M plus one be another index. Um, now let's write this out, S one, S M, E1 um, for 0, 1. So we're kind of like, it's like a marginal. Um, this is equal to lambda 1 over nj plus 1. Same thing, i equals 0 to nj, i1, ts1, ai, to chi m, ts m, ai. And now we have chi of 0, 1. Okay, T 
as n plus one ai um, infinity it's a big mess the point is this thing here is equal to one right because of course of course we're in the set zero one um, so you know it's it's, um, it's just the same as before so by Kamogra consistency theorem Okay, so we, we have the um, a measure defined on these rectangles. So we have um, measure on the whole of X such that for all S1, Sn in um, zero and E1, M uh, subsets of zero one. Okay, measure of this x in x, uh, x s one e one x s m and e m. Okay, is equal to the measure of s one s m e one. these measures were just on zero, like finite um, segments. Okay, um, so what more do we need? We need, um, we need, we need this to be invariant under the, um, the shift T, okay? And this is kind of a, well, it's a little bit hairy because, I mean, if we take this and mu T minus one, X and X, X S one one X M in E M. Okay, so we want it to be invariant, right? So that's why this minus one here. We want to show that it's the same as uh, if we didn't do that. This is, this is actually a set. Okay. Um, well, if we work this out, it's the, in all its gory details, we have i equals zero to mj s one plus one ai So there's a plus one going on everywhere. Um, there's a plus one here, and we can, I mean. We can sort of express that by just saying that, um, by just absorbing that plus one into the, the index here. So i goes from one to mj plus one, um, one ts one ai, m ts m ai, j equals one to infinity. And well, this is not exactly the same as what we had before, right? Because before we had sum from zero to mj. So right from zero, from zero to mj. That's what that's before we applied what am I doing? Yeah, that's before we applied um, t inverse. Um, but that's okay because the difference between that like in the inner sequence, the difference between this and what it was before is no more than um, I mean all of them are almost the same, right? It's just the zero term has been taken out. And we added in the n plus one term, so the difference is no more than um, one. Right, the difference is no more than one over n j plus one. Okay, and as j goes to infinity, that means that these two sequences are going to be closer and closer and closer together. So their limits under lambda will be the same. Okay, I might be hand waving over here, but that's it's true. So we're almost home. So let B be the cylinder. It's called a cylinder. It's the set of all sequences. All sequences. Sequences with x0 equal to 1. So all sequences that have a 1 and then anything else after it. Okay. The measure of B okay, is the mean of, uh, oops, 
Yes, mu is all x and x, right? Such that um, x zero x zero equals one. Let's just write that out. That's the set of all x and x um, for which chi i of one, or I guess it's kind of literally this. Right, and that's equal to lambda. Um, of mu zero, sorry, that's why it was making sense. Um, this is i equals zero to n j i one. I um j equals one to infinity. Okay, and this is equal to lambda. If we think about this, what it's saying is is the i element of a um of ai equal to one. So it's the same as a intersection zero to nj or nj plus one, j equals one to infinity. Um, and well, that's greater than because I'm just greater than an inf. Just take the n j equals zero. The intersection is zero and j. J plus one. And remember, we chose the j's, the sequence of j's, so that the limit inf is greater than zero. So we have mu of b is greater than zero. Okay, so it's kind of all coming together. Since mu of b is greater than zero. Um, chi b has expectation mu b, right? So we can apply first to merge recurrence. Um, so apply. Theorem to chi of b. Uh, and k, the k that b. I never let k be an integer. K, let K be an integer. Okay, um, we apply it to the characteristic function of B and K to get this. So mu um, T minus R of B intersection T minus K minus one B is greater than zero. So we have all the minuses because it's characteristic function and like we showed before, um, F is chi of B, and we can, when you take it out, it becomes minus. Okay, and A minus S, this is just notation, but we'll just say it'll make it easier. It's a set of all A minus S for A and A. Okay, so we're gonna work backwards. So we have this, then soup J equals infinity, A intersection, A minus R, intersection uh, a minus k minus one r intersection zero to nj all over nj plus one this is greater than or equal to because lim soup is sandwich you can take uh, sorry lambda is sandwich you, it's just lambda the same thing okay uh, a minus r a minus k minus one r zero on j. Oh, well, this is over j plus one. Uh, that's a sequence j equals one to infinity. We apply lambda to it. Okay, what is that? If we kind of go back to our um, gross um, notation with the characteristic functions, well, spelling it all out, we have one over n j plus one sum i equals zero and j chi of one ai um, chi of one tr ai and it's a product chi, all the way up to chi of one t k minus one r okay. and once again j equals one to infinity and we apply lambda to all of that but i mean how we define mu is what well, we just mu 
of the set of all x and x such that x0 is equal to 1, xr is equal to 1, and xk minus 1 is equal to 1. Okay, and this is mu of b, intersection t minus rb, intersection t minus k minus 1 r b. And like you saw here, that's greater than zero. Okay. And what that means is like, remember what it means for all these indices to all be one. That means that all these numbers, zero r, k minus one r, are on A after some shifting. So that's why we add. So it's so zero r up to k minus one r are all in A after we shift them around. So we add A to everything, some base point that we don't know, A, A plus R, A plus K minus one R, and they're all in A, okay? So what does it say? So there is an arithmetic regression of length K in A, and that proves some of these two. Okay, so the, I mean, when Furstenberg proves, proved this, um, we already knew some of these theorem. So um, this is kind of an, an interesting statement, ergodic statement in general. I believe that Furstenberg oops, didn't, um, he didn't have this sort of, this is a bit of a refinement. I think he just said that there exists an S sort of, and you know, there's, it's not like the, uh, the measures of uh, greater than zero or something. Um, but um, but it's equivalent. Um, like a lot of these ergodic things, if you have one, you often have infinitely many or a, a positive measure, right? Um, and yeah, it, it's not so much in the statement itself, but what it allowed people to do. Because after 1977, um, in the 80s and 90s, sort of there was a, a bunch of, I guess, ergodic theorists ran onto the scene and proved all sorts of common plural theorems. Um, using ergodic methods. And um, then it took years later before people started to um, prove it, prove these common control theorems um, using purely common control arguments. For example, we have um, the multidimensional similarity theorem where it's sort of the same as in the integers, but on like the um, integer lattice and multiple dimensions. Um, you can, if you have any sort of constellation of points up to scaling and um, translation, you will be able to find it in any positive density um, subset of, and all sorts of polynomial versions and all kinds of versions of some of these theorem. And a lot of these were first proved with ergodic methods. Um, so it's not so much a statement, um, but this equivalence allowed people to see a sort of general correspondence between um, theorems and dynamical systems on the one hand and in common networks on the other. Okay, so that's, That'll be all for today. It is um, already a pretty long video. I'll see you next time.